Um, I was down at an Aboriginal convention with Bill Newman, which is quite an experience. I loved every minute of it. Nothing runs on time. Not a thing. Um, but it was wonderful. People uh, came to the Lord. People recommitted their hearts to the Lord. It was a really beautiful time. And um, I have to tell you this, my quote of the, of the weekend, which I just loved, there was this old Aboriginal man from um, the Northern Territory. And uh, I said, where are you from? He said, Elliot. Does anybody know where that is? I said, I don't know where that is. I said, I'm sorry. Excuse my ignorance. I don't know where Elliot is. I said, what's it near? And he said, not much. <laughs> That was my favourite bit. Um, then we went from there, we went down to the ACC Pastors Convention down on the Gold Coast for a few days during the middle of the week. Uh, the Lord really spoke to us there about where we're going as a church and what's happening. I believe we are in the zone, folks. We are, we are doing what the Lord wants us to do. Isn't that exciting? And uh, we're about to move into our new premises down there at Nambour. I went down there and I saw the signs. And it opened up my eyes, I saw the sign. But it was great. We have signs that we're not there, but we have signs. Um, so that's wonderful. We had a guest speaker the first night of convention when uh, Prime Minister Scott Morrison came and spoke to our pastors. How cool is that? And, uh, and challenged us. He said, this nation needs two things. He said, I need you to help me out, pastors. I need two things from you. I need you to, to preach truth and I need you to create community. And that is exactly where we think we are going. Isn't that great? When the Prime Minister commends you, uh, it's wonderful. Uh, today, of course, is uh, Anzac Day. Did you figure that out? Who went to an early morning service? A few? That's, that's great. Uh, we're going to, uh, this service is going to focus on Anzac Day because, of course, it's our National Day of Remembrance for our servicemen. Uh, on the 25th of April 1915, Australia and New Zealand soldiers form part of an Allied expedition to, the, to capture the, the peninsula of Gallipoli in Turkey. The objective was to capture Constantinople, which is now the, the capital of Turkey. It was now Istanbul. It's called Istanbul. It's the capital of the Ottoman Empire at the time. And they became known as Anzacs because it's Australian and New Zealand Army Corps. And we don't agree with the Kiwis on much, but we definitely do on Anzac. <laughs> don't ask us about football or cricket, but Anzac definitely. But it is, it is wonderful that, that, that we commemorate that day. And we're one of the few nations in the world that remembers a defeat. Did you know that? Gallipoli and the whole campaign in the Dardanelles was a disaster. And we didn't win. We actually, outside, lost. We were thrown back out. In fact, uh, we were on the peninsula for many months in 1915. Over 8,000 Australian soldiers were killed. Many more uh, Turks were killed and uh, other nationalities. But we actually remember a failed military campaign. Isn't that so Australian? <laughs> Don't you love that? Yay, we lost. But, you know, we remember the sacrifice because win, lose or draw, there was incredible sacrifice made on that day. But sadly, in 2021, many of, many of the values they fought for and died for are being destroyed by acts of parliament. And I'm going to speak pretty plainly this morning. I'll probably get in trouble. But I don't care because someone needs to proclaim truth to this nation, don't they? Amen. And we are in a battle, folks. They call World War I the, world to end, uh, sorry, the, the war to end all wars. But little did they know that only 21 years later they will be plunged into an even bigger and deadlier campaign. Um, why does this happen? Why do we keep revisiting wars? Jeremiah puts it well, Jeremiah 17 verse 9. The heart of man is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And people are just like that. We have wars because people are selfish and they want stuff for themselves and they don't agree. And we are all, I think you'll agree, desperately wicked. But we can look back with pride and thankfulness at what our soldiers have done. Our troops were the first to liberate Palestine from centuries of Muslim control. And on December 17, 1917, and, and over the years, uh, we've fought for, in Europe, we fought in the Middle East, in Asia and in the Pacific. My grandfather was actually killed on Timor in Indonesia and he's buried on Ambon, which is another island in Indonesia. So many of us, uh, you know, would have relatives back in our line who were affected by the, the various wars that we fought in. Their bravery across many battlefields is, is remembered on this day. But if I were to choose one battle that would sum up Australia, it would have to be the charge of Beersheba, the charge of the light horsemen, many of whom came from this very town of Wumbai. 
So let's, let me fill you in on a bit of background here, and I want to take you back to that fateful day in Beersheba. That's a photograph of them lining up for the charge. There's some photos of them actually, uh, you know, during this particular time in history. <coughs> Centuries of crusades, generals and empires had failed to capture Jerusalem and several had, um, attempts by the British had been repelled. They realised the only way to Jerusalem was to go through Beersheba, which is right in the south, and take that road right up the middle of the Holy Land. So by the time the Australian Light Horse arrived on the scene, the situation was dire. There were several attacks on the city which had failed. The Light Horsemen were low on water and they knew that they must either take this heavily fortified town of Beersheba or face a 14-hour trek back across the desert to get precious water. It was dire at this time. So on the 31st of October 1917, a bunch of crazy young Aussies stood poised to mount a suicidal frontal attack against overwhelming odds. That's very Australian too, isn't it? Which became destined to be the last of the great cavalry charges in history. You've heard of the Charge of the Light Brigade. This was the Charge of the Light Horsemen. The Charge of the Light Brigade was back in, in, in the 1800s. This was the last cavalry charge in history, the last great one. So 800 young Australians lined up for a suicidal charge into the 4,500 Turkish entrenched in their fortified position some six kilometres away in the town of Beersheba. They were outnumbered nearly six to one. And without artillery support, the first wave started to trot and then opened into a gallop as the Turks lobbed shells into their lines, killing a few of them there. But these young Aussies didn't flinch in the face of this attack. They opened up into a full, cal full gallop, e -blue, emu plumes sort of flying from their slouch hats. And if you've seen uh, the group that, that, that uh, reenacts this out here, we have a group right here in Wombai that does it and they have the plumes and their, their hats and everything. The Turks began to panic, and in their panic they found they could not lower the sights of the guns fast enough to target the oncoming, onrushing Australians. So the shells exploded harmlessly over their heads and behind them. The light horsemen screamed and charged faster and faster as the Turkish machine guns were brought to bear. But again, the charge was so bold and so fast they could not lower the sights on the machine guns fast enough to target the onrushing Australians. They hit the front trench, they left it at a single bound and did the same for the reserve trench and on and on into the streets of Beersheba and by sundown the town was theirs. Now interestingly, <coughs> there were 19 wells in Beersheba and the Germans had them all, the Germans were helping the Turks because they were allies and they had a German commander there had the, all, of the, all, of the, uh, all of the wells mined. Now had he have blown all of those wells the whole town would have, would have died of thirst, including the Australian soldiers. But the Lord smiled on our troops that day. He was only able to blow up two, so 17 wells remained and the town was saved. Isn't that a great story? See, in typical Aussie fashion, and I love the way our guys did the impossible, don't you? Aren't you proud to be Australian this day? But in typical Aussie fashion, one trooper was asked why he charged so fiercely towards Beersheba. He replied, Beersheba? Some joker knocked off the second half of the sign. I thought we were charging towards beer. <laughs> and that is Australian right there. <laughs> so what 11 Crusades, the genius of Napoleon and the might of the British Army had failed to do, 800 fresh-faced young Australian light horsemen achieved and the way was open to the city of Jerusalem to set it free from Muslim domination. God used the smallest and at the time the youngest nation on earth to set the city of David free, which they did on December 17, 1917. Now, our boys stood in the face of overwhelming opposition and they, 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 they just gathered their courage together. They believed God was with them and they charged. And of course, much of the Second Light Horse Regiment was drawn from this very area, from Wombai, right here in Surrounds. But folks, now it's our turn. Without being too dramatic, I believe Australia has never, we've never actually been invaded by an enemy, but I believe that we are under attack right now in our nation, and the attack is from within. Many of the values that our forefathers fought for, many of the values that they died for, are being destroyed, by a political socialist agenda and a biased media right here. It's a fifth column 
operating underneath what is going on, but trust me, they have an agenda. Never before in our history, certainly in my lifetime, have we ever seen such a concerted, insidious attack that is targeting the very moral fabric of our nation. And make no mistake, what we see today, what you hear in the media today is not tolerance, it's not political change, it is an invasion by the evil enemy seeking to destroy and decimate our culture and dominate our children. That's what it is. <laughs> Proverbs 14.34 says this, Righteousness exalts the nation, but sin is a disgrace to any people. And while I am proud to be an Australian today for what my forefathers did, and I was proud to listen to our Prime Minister call us to arms during the week, I am ashamed to be Australian for what our politicians and media are doing, especially in this state. In the face of such rampant evil, in the growing tide of darkness, we, like those 800 young men, must face a choice. Do we turn and run? Do we meekly shut our mouths and champion so-called tolerance? Or do we stand and fight for what is right? Stand and fight. Good choice. Our society is being plunged into a level of darkness beyond anything we have ever experienced in our lifetime. And we are called to be salt and light into this dark world. John chapter 3. Listen to what it says. We know John 3.16, for God so loved the world. It's a great verse on salvation but listen to what it says in verse 19 because John goes on to sort of explain why people didn't accept Jesus listen to what he says this is the judgment the light meaning Jesus has come into the world but people love the darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil for everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come into the light lest his works should be exposed but whoever does what is true comes into the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. See, evil people love darkness. They do. Why do you think nightclubs and all this stuff operate at night? Under cover of darkness. Why do you think all of, many of the vices that we face happen under darkness, not in broad daylight? Because they're ashamed, really. But we are seeing now this growing boldness in our enemies out there. Those 800 light horsemen could have turned back. They could have said, it's too hard. Let's just take the easy way. Let's just go back and get water. But they decided to take a chance, to make a stand, to mount a suicidal charge into the teeth of those Turkish guns, believing God was with them. And I believe God is with us now. If we choose to fight and pray, we believe and believe for our nation. We do not stand alone, for God stands with us. And last I checked, the one who is in us is greater than the one who is in the world. And trust me, fight we must. Not just for the Lord, not just for our churches, not just for our way of life, not just for what is right and wrong. We, not, we must fight for our children and our children's children. Because if this stuff hangs around and takes a grip that they're, that they're sort of plying out there, then our kids and their kids and generations to come will suffer from this. They make all these decisions these days, but we don't know what that looks like 10 or 20 years from now. And I can tell you, people are going to get hurt. Kids are going to get destroyed if we are complacent. I believe it's time to make a stand. This coming year, you and I face a choice. We can quietly tow the, the society's party line. We can slink off to avoid criticism from our friends, or we can stand and fight for what we believe in. What's it going to be this morning? Stand and fight. Thank you. Three of you are with me. Awesome. <laughs> no, I know the rest of you are. Just three are more vocal. That's great. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 4 to 5. Listen to what it says. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh. Let me say that again. The weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised up against the knowledge of God, and we take every thought captive to obey Christ. Now we need to do this church. We have to mount up, face those spiritual guns and together stand and fight against everything that is contrary to the word of God. That's our standard. And trust me, they will attack. The enemy will attack. They will use every means at their disposal. Insults, mockery, accusations of hate speech, and now even threats, not even veiled threats. They will use real threats. In the state of Victoria, as I've mentioned before, 
If you speak against transgenderism, even as a pastor or a doctor or a counsellor, then you can be arrested and put in jail according to their law. That's coming here, folks. Make no bones about it. This, we're in a fight. We're in a fight to the death here for our kids. But we can use divine weapons, weapons which God says we can win with. We fight with weapons like prayer and faith and unity and love in the face of persecution, the truth in the face of lies, and choosing to honour and respect even those who hate us. When 800 light horsemen fought, they fought with horse and gun and bayonet, but we fight with truth and love and prayer. That's our weapons. So in this coming battle, do not be surprised at the venom of the attack, even from fellow Christians, and I hate to say those words, but that's a fact. There are Christians who just bow to all of this stuff and then attack us with everybody else. But John 15, 18, Jesus says this, if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. See, the, you know, they hated Jesus before they hated us. Those who love compromise won't love us. But I, for one, am prepared to stand and to fight for what I believe in and to fight for what is right anywhere, anytime. <coughs> but listen, we cannot win our nation to Jesus Christ by hating them more than they hate us. That's not going to work. Ours is the way of the Saviour. The way of truth in the face of bigotry. The way of joy in the face of fear. And above all, love in the face of persecution. Our chief weapon is not prejudice, it's prayer. And I believe that we can, if we combine our faith together in prayer, we can see God do miraculous things in our nation. Do I hear an amen to that? 1 Timothy 6 verse 12 says this, Fight the good fight of faith. And I want to encourage you, fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and a bit about which you made a good confession in the presence of many witnesses, but fight the good fight of faith. Now, let me just finish up here by sharing with you some of the battlefronts in which we engage. You know, you're saying, what, what are you talking about? Where's this? What's going on? Where is this fight? Let me tell you some of the battlefronts we face. Number one, morality. Morality is clearly a primary battlefront. Yeah. I'm getting to that. <laughs> the moral corruption and degradation in our society has certainly been ramped up and the enemy feels like he's winning. Romans chapter 1 verses 28. Let me read this to you. This is the end of Romans 1 where Paul outlines the way a sinful world looks. Pay particular attention to the end of this. He, he writes this. Since they, <coughs> since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil covetedness, malice. They're full of envy, murder, strife, etc., etc. Foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but they give approval to those who practice them. What do you think we are seeing in our nation right now? What do you think is going on? We've got Christian leaders not partaking in some of this stuff, but giving approval to those who do. And according to that verse, they suffer the same fate as those who do it anyway. You see, it's, you've got to be careful with your, your, your political correctness, because if you give approval to everything, all that is required for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. And if, if, the, if we give approval left, right and centre to everything, we're no, we're no different to anybody else out there. We're not fighting a battle. We're floating along in the tide like a dead fish. See, that's what we're seeing. In the rise of militant gay and lesbian action, I'm going to be, I told you I'd be specific. Probably get into trouble for this, but anyway, there you go. Um, militant gay and lesbian action started with a plebiscite. Remember that? Hey, we just want to get married. Hey, we just want to get married. Thin end of the wedge, folks. We said it at the time. What's come along after that? Now they're pushing transgenderism through schools with the blessing of media and many governments. It's openly and heavenly promoted in schools, while abortion is now legal up until birth in this state. You can be just about to give birth and you can legally get an abortion right now. That is, and I tell you, folks, if God doesn't punish Australia for what's going on, he's going to have to apologise to Sodom and Gomorrah because it is evil. That is evil. 
It's not Advance Australia Fair, it's Advance Australia wherever some vocal minority wants. And we're advancing into a moral void that spells disaster. You watch, euthanasia's the next thing, it'll come along. It's a, it's a whole agenda, folks. It's not just one thing. But step back. These are the guys, one of the guys, anyway, that are pushing it, the LGBTQI. Yeah, they don't even know who they are. They keep adding letters to the end of it because they're not even sure who they are. This is where we are at. And if you step back from it, you'd say, this is foolish. Why do you have 50 letters up, you know? What's going on? Because we have just let this thing slide, folks. We have. And that's what's coming down the line. And now it's getting so confusing because they're saying, according to the, the, the transgender stuff, that anyone who identifies as a member of the opposite sex can become one. Right? That's what they're saying. If, you identi if you're a male but you identify as a woman, you can become a woman. But then when a six-foot-four muscle-bound transgender woman is banned from playing football because he's hurting everybody else. They go, oh, well, yeah, you can be a woman, but you can't play women's football. Well, which one is it? Make up your mind. Make up your mind. If you're going to have this stuff, have it across the board. But don't say, well, you can't do that because you're clearly, you know, a, a foot taller and, 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 you know, heavier and more muscle-bound than all the rest. It does, see, it doesn't make any sense. Are you with me? Are you confused? Because I am when I look at all that. Make no mistake, the battle lines are drawn. The battle is on and the guns of these lobby groups are aimed squarely at us. Not Muslims. Not Hindus. Not atheists. They're aimed at Christians right across our nation. Christians are the enemy. In fact, before we had lockdown, Muslim leaders whose countries preach death to homosexuals are, were welcomed into our our state and our government welcomed them in. And no one said anything, even though their countries murder these folks. And we are saying we need to love them. We don't have to agree with them, but you need to love them. They are at definitely targeting us. I was talking actually during the week with some people and they said, isn't it incredible that footballers... Who, who get fired from or, and get reinstated to football teams and don't lose their livelihood, who have committed crimes like domestic abuse, gang raping girls or drunken rampages, they just get excused and a footballer who writes something on his Instagram gets banned for life. Where's the, where's the sense in it? How does that even make sense? Whether you agree with him or not, surely there's a place for free speech. Don't we have freedom in our... Didn't our forefathers die for this stuff? so that we could be free. But apparently, if you think you're free, think again. Because you, you can't even have an opinion different to everybody else. You can't even believe something different. So that's the second, second battlefront we're going to look at is the mind. You see, the second, the, the Australians are being targeted in our minds. Now, the enemy is not targeting the older ones. Who's he targeting? The young ones. He's targeting kids. He's using schools and social media and peer pressure. In the minds of Australians, especially young Australians, they look at the church, they say, you guys are old-fashioned and antiquated and prejudicial and you have offensive morality and you're preventing people from exercising the right to express their true selves. That's what they think of the church. We are largely irrelevant to the young population because we have been so limp and, 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 and wishy-washy on all of these important issues. I cannot remember a time in history where people's minds are so easily offended. Can you? Used to be a time you took offence. If you didn't agree, you kept quiet, but not anymore. Man, for all of our intelligence and scientific minds, for all of our great technology and all that sort of stuff, we are currently so fragile that we are so easily offended. I mean, don't believe me? Have a look at social media, the explosions, the accusations, the rants on social media. Not only do people's opinions change every five minutes, but they're prepared to, to defend those opinions to, to the point of death, even though five minutes before they had another opinion. This is where people's minds are at. But remember, our fight is not against people. 
Let me make this clear. We are not fighting against people. We are fighting against the spirit behind all of this stuff. Because, uh, uh, well, let's have a look at it. Ephesians 6.12. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present age, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. And those spiritual forces of evil are running rampant across the nation of Australia today. They're, they're, that's who our fight is with, not with people. We need to love people and we need to fight the forces of darkness. And look, if you look across our nation, the minds of our young people are being so attacked, mental health problems have gone through the ceiling. And it's not just COVID or no COVID. The enemy is fighting for their minds. They are confused. They lack hope. They lack any reason to live. And so many of them choose to not live. The third thing we're facing is meism. Meism. This could be the most selfish, self-absorbed generation in history. It's the age of the selfie. And never before have so many photos been taken of so many people doing so little. <laughs> I remember Fiona and I were in an airport in, in China and there was this very pretty Chinese lady. And I kid you not, she must have taken four or five hundred photos of herself during our time sitting there to, you know. <laughs> 2 Timothy 3 verses 1 to 4 says this, Understand this, in the last days there will come times of difficulty. People will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving, good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Man, that sums us up, doesn't it? Why do we have family breakdowns? Why do we have abuse? Why do we have broken lives? Because people at the heart of it are selfish. We value ourselves. We want what we want. We don't care if it hurts someone else to get it. We want what we want. And what's more, we believe our opinion is superior to anybody else's. So we fight and claw to get whatever we can. Watch out for this because even as Christians, the enemy can use this against us. It's not just about you. This is why community is so important. Because when you're in community, you realize your self-interests are not the be-all and end-all. You need to love your brother, love your sister, care for them. Go out of your way to help them. The fourth area of attack is money. Believe it or not, people say there's not enough money. That's not true. There's lots of it. It's just not in my pocket or yours. But it is out there. Money controls most, or the enemy controls most of the money. But the greater evil is not government or rich people. It's the spirit behind this agenda. Okay. 1 Timothy 6.10 says, The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. The love of money, not money. Money's neutral. If you think your money's evil, give it to me. No problem. I'll make it good. <laughs> you know, Charles Wesley said that. When, when the pubs were giving him money, they said, you can't take that, that's evil money. He said, oh, you let them give me their evil money and I'll show you how good I can make it, you know. <laughs> but money's not evil, but the spirit behind it, this selfish spirit behind it is evil. And the love of money is a constant source of evil, not only in our lives, but right across our society. And the enemy fights hard. The fifth thing is media. A great strategic battlefield where the enemy is triumphing right now. Social media has become a cesspool of human emotions, opinions and aggressive attacks on anybody who differs in any way on any subject. It, hasn't it? Yes. Social media is like you get on Facebook and if you don't believe me, get on Facebook and write one simple message up there about, you know, anything that you, you know, gay, transgender, whatever, abortion, whatever. If you write something there, man, I'll give you about five minutes and they will turn on you. You will get a string of people attacking you because it's like a cesspool out there. Um, there's been a lot of controversy recently. They've just called in the, I, I know it doesn't interest you because it's football, but in the Premier League, they've just called a shutdown on all social media. Because people are getting on there and if a guy misses a goal or says something, they, they attack and actually have death threats against them. That's, where, that's where, they, where we're at. That's where people are at. And it is total, <coughs> totally dominated by an evil agenda and an anti-Christian sentiment. 2 Timothy 3 verse 12 says this, All who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. 
while evil people and impostors will go about from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. Does that sum our nation up? This is why we've got to fight. It's Anzac Day, we're talking about fighting. This is the fight we face. And these forces are in us and around us. Today in Australia, the media is all powerful. I mean all powerful. But make no mistake, it's a battle of attrition and they are out to dull our conscience and wear us down. That's what they're about. They want to just work us into the ground, slowly but surely. Now, if you don't believe that, that, that those lobby groups have any power, I want you to think about television shows and movies, particularly those that come from the United States. According to statistics, less than 3% of America is homosexual, yet 100% of American TV shows and movies feature at least one homosexual. 100%! There's 3% of them in, in the society, but 100% of them are represented in TV shows. According to a 2017 Gallup survey in the United States, 71.2% uh, of Americans identify as Christians, Catholics and Protestants, but they rarely, Christians, Catholics and Protestants rarely ever appear on TV shows. And when they do, they're cast in a terrible light, like they're a bunch of weird, stupid, legalistic, negative idiots. That's what the media is doing. It's subtle, but it is there. You watch every TV show, Almost every movie, wherever it is, they have got to... I don't know if it's law or not over there, but that's what we see in all of our movies. TV shows, music, social media and print. Christians are the most persecuted group in this country right now. Did you know that? These groups will say, well, we're persecuted. No, you're not. Christians are persecuted. More than any other group in Australia, Christians are persecuted. Just ask Martin Niles. That guy, is a, he's a trooper. I mean, we need to support, I don't care if you agree with him or not support him because he is a lone voice out there and we need to stand with him and with the Australian Christian lobby because they're standing for truth and they're doing it in love. They keep trying to, oh, that's hate speech. That's, it's not hate speech. He explained that the other day on television. It's love speech because we love you and we want you to have a great life. But it, just because you love someone doesn't mean you have to agree with them. Is that true? They will tell you if you love someone, you'll agree with them. Not true. Not true. Do you love your children? Do you agree with everything they do? There you go. You can still love them even if you disagree. But listen, you know, it sounds pretty negative going through all these battlefronts. But listen, I'm telling you, a setback is just a setup for a comeback because we are coming back. I believe, I'm sounding the alarm this morning, it's Anzac Day 2021, I believe that we should make a stand and I believe that we should start loving people into the kingdom, not just rolling over and playing dead. We shall fight. Let me finish this message with a call to spiritual arms on Anzac Day by paraphrasing a speech given by Winston Churchill on June the 4th, 1940. Do you want to come up? Have the team up here, thanks. Now, I'm paraphrasing it a little bit to adapt it to what we have, but listen to what he almost said, what he would have said if he was me. I'm paraphrasing, I am paraphrasing, I have slightly changed it, listen to this. Even though large tracts of our world have fallen into the grip of the devil, we shall not flag or fail. We shall go on to the end. We shall fight them on the beaches. We shall fight them in the hills. We shall defend our island, whatever the cost. We shall fight them in the media. We shall fight them in the schools and in the homes. We shall fight them in the churches and elections. But most of all, we shall fight them in the prayer closet. We shall never surrender. And when our leader returns one day soon, I hope that he will look at this generation and say this was their finest hour. Amen. Our fight, our fight for, the, for the souls and the hearts and the minds of our nation starts within. It starts in our heart. It starts in our mind. Colossians 3.2 says, Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. It starts here, folks. Today on Anzac Day 2021, I'm sounding an alarm to the people of God and I'm calling you to stand and fight as your forefathers did for what we believe in. 
to turn and face the guns of the enemy, to charge into the breach and to stand firm and to never give up. Ephesians 6, finally be strong in the Lord, in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armour of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the cosmic powers and authorities of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, take up the whole armour of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all, to stand firm. So I'm going to ask you this morning, it's going to be a little bit different. But I thought being Anzac Day, we're allowed to be a little bit different. I'm going to ask you to join me this morning in standing firm for Jesus in our nation. I'm going to ask you, I'm going to call you to prayer. I'm going to call you to start sharing the gospel with your your friends and your relatives. I'm going to call you to truth. To say, I don't care what you say, lobby group. The word of God says this. That's our standard. I'm not calling you to hate. I'm calling you to love. I'm not calling you to fear. I'm calling you to fight. I'm not calling you to persecute. I'm calling you to pray. So I'm going to ask you to join me now as we pray for our nation. Because this fight, folks, is not about taking people on and trying to win an argument. This fight happens on our knees. Only the Holy Spirit can break through in our nation and win our people to Jesus. And so we need to get on our knees. We need to pray up a storm and to pray and believing, believe that God will save our nation. Are you with me? 800 young horsemen flew into the teeth of a battle. This is your moment. What are you going to do? Would you bow your heads and pray? Lord, you've laid down a challenge to us this morning. You've made it pretty clear. I've spoken very plainly. But I believe, God, that you are calling us to stand and fight on our knees for our nation, for the hearts and minds and souls of our people, particularly the next generation. Lord, I pray that you would speak to us, that we would be able to to speak the words of Christ into any situation. And above all, Lord, that we would pray for our people and our prime minister, that we would not be quick to criticize but that we would stand firm on the things that really matter. Ignite, I'm calling you to arms this morning. I believe this is a pivotal moment in our nation's history and that you are part of it. And if you are prepared to stand for what is true and right in our nation, I'm going to ask you to stand right where you are. Just stand up right where you are. I'm hoping you all do it because... I can't do this alone. We need to stand and we need to fight. doesn't matter your age. doesn't matter your background or your doctrine. We need to stand and we need to fight in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, you see these people standing in pledge that we will stand for what is right. And when all is said and done, we will stand firmly. Lord, I pray that you would challenge us. Lord, that you would help direct us into the hearts and souls and minds of our nation, that we might love them, not hate them, that we might reach out to them and win them by the love of Jesus Christ. They'll know we are Christians by our love. You can't hate people into the kingdom. You can love them, though. And Lord, we pledge now to to have an undying love for our people. Lord, fill us with your Holy Spirit and bind us together in unity. Because if we fracture into disunity, all will be lost for our people. We need to stand as one. So now, Lord, as we stand and we focus on you, I pray, Father, that you would speak to our hearts, that you would challenge us and lead us in the name of Jesus Christ. And the people said, Amen. Amen. I don't know how we're going to do this, and I don't know what COVID restrictions say to this, but I'm going to ask you to the front. We haven't got no much front here. I want you to come and stand at the front and we're going to finish with an almighty prayer time and worship time. Can you do that? Can we move chairs back a little bit so that we can all fit in a group around here? Let's just move these chairs out of the way. Come on, why don't you stand with us?
and ask you to come to the front and we're going to stand and pray together. Come on, make your way down here. Let's stand together. Sing again. This is our nation. This is our land. This is our future. This is our home. A land of reaping and a harvest. This is our. Come on, come on, sneak up to the front, right up the front. Come on. This is the great sound the Holy Spirit, let it wreck God's place, and summer rains, until the sun the land, we will see our blood, to the streets of land, the Spirit comes. Come on, this is our nation. This is our nation. that is above every name and we come and we claim Lord souls for you oh God just touch our hearts afresh this morning let your anointing just flow through our beings. Lord, we want to serve you. We want you to touch our lives so that we can spread the message 
the message that is powerful, the message that brings life, the message that brings deliverance to people. Lord, we just pray in the name of Jesus that you would touch each of us this day. Lord, may we spread forth the message of the cross. Lord, may we spread forth the message of a living Christ, a Christ that lives. He is not dead. He is able to do more than we can even think. So, Father, we come in Jesus' name and we just ask afresh, touch us, Lord, with your Holy Spirit that we may be true witnesses of a living Christ. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen.